dad drink Listerine. He didn't have a terrible case of halitosis. He was instead an alcoholic. And Listerine is 54 proof, which is the equivalent of a martini. On a very hot July day in 1998, my dad drank Listerine while I drove him to rehab. During the drive, he was in deep, deep denial. While he drank the mouthwash, he bragged about various women in his life, his accounting business, and, and even his golf game. I was a graduate st student at the time. I was old enough to know that this was really tragic, but I was still young enough to be optimistic. So seven years later, it was in 2005, I was at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And it was a rainy and chilly evening when I got the phone call and received the news that my dad had unfortunately drank himself to death. Now, the contrast was obvious and it was stark. I mean, here I was at some fancy pants European university while my dad had died all alone in some flea bag motel in rural Kentucky. You see, the, the personal is political. Even before his death, I knew that my chosen vocation and his alcoholism were, were somehow intertwined. Indeed, it is no accident that I study political movements that are dedicated to enhancing human dignity. Thus, the combination of my work experience and my life experience have, have led me to embrace an ethos of tragic optimism, which understands that the world has fallen. Bad things happen. At the same time, the world is not going to hell. And so this basic idea and my tragic optimism were very much, in a very real sense, born in that fateful July car ride. So tragic optimism, it holds that the first role of the state, meaning government, what's the first thing government should do? It needs to stop the worst things from happening. From world wars and genocide to poverty and pandemics, I mean, politics is about organizing society so that the worst assaults upon human dignity they occur rarely. Once we get to that point, that's when we address higher order aims. Unfortunately, it has taken the majority of human history to render the worst from normal to occasional happenstances. But here's the good thing, is that over the past 1,000 years, and especially in the preceding 70, the world has slowly, if unsteadily, become less violent, more stable, and relatively prosperous. It, and that, that's the essence of tragic optimism, isn't it? That war, poverty, and violence, they remain our constant companions. But the trend lines that are pointing toward a better world are utterly clear. Ironically, tragic optimism was born in Auschwitz. So the site of the largest mass murder in human history, 1.2 million lives murdered, bequeathed a survivor, Viktor Frankl. And Frankl used his experience in Auschwitz to inform and found an extraordinarily influential school of psychotherapy. And what Frankl discovered in his time in Auschwitz is that human beings, even at our worst moments, our most darkest, deepest moments, we are still capable of finding meaning. In conjunction with Frankel is this dude, Reinhold Niebuhr. Now, I know many of you don't know who this guy is, but I, I, I would bet a lot of money that there's a significant number of you who are familiar with his most popular creation, the Serenity Prayer. God, give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed the courage to change the things which should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Frankl penned this prayer 
1943, which was the lowest point of World War II, which happened to be maybe the darkest moment of the 20th century. And yet again, this is the essence of tragic optimism. We can't make every crooked thing straight, but we are able to move the needle on significant matters. Importantly, a generation of thinkers and doers and politicians imbued this idea of tragic optimism in the very institutions that have helped create a more stable, more affluent, and, and, and better world. In fact, today, November 5th, 2016, we live in the most stable, secure, and affluent era in all of human history. Now, when I talk about this in class, because I'm a professor, I get some pushback from students, and, and I get it. They're like, hey, Bloodworth, when you turn on the news, you know, war, poverty, violence, they're ever-present. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But if we take a step back, right, and we look at the long arc of human history, what we see is that war is less common and it is less deadly. That murder rates are not just lower, they have absolutely cratered. And in terms of prosperity, we are living in the most affluent time in all of human history. So let's start with war. War is less deadly. Now that's a counterintuitive claim. We all understand that modern weapons are so much more lethal than the weapons of the past. But if we look at the wars in the distant past, as this slide shows, and we compare it to the death rates of wars in the distant past, to the death rates of the 20th century, what we see is, is that wars in the distant past, huge majorities of given populations died. And it's not just that death rates are lower, it's that war is also less common. Western Europe is, a, is the example of this. For 545 years, Western Europe averaged a war every two years. That's for 545 years. Since 1945, Western Europe, there's not been one West European state that has gone to war against another West European state. Not one. Now, this West European phenomenon emphasizes, it reveals a larger global phenomenon where wars are less deadly and they are less common. Indeed, the most violent and deadly kind of wars, these are called state-to-state -state conflicts, that's when one country declares war against another. What we've seen is that those wars are increasingly rare. This graph shows um, the, the number of state-to-state -state conflicts since 1945, and as you can see, they have radically fallen. In their stead, the most common war today are civil wars. Yet again, tragic optimism. We all understand, I hope, that the current civil war in Syria is heartbreaking, and it threatens the stability of an entire region. However, civil wars are profoundly less violent than the multi-nation, state-to-state wars of the past. So it's not just war that's making, or the decline in war that's making the world less violent, it is also the rise of human security. In fact, as this graph reveals, violent death was utterly common in prehistoric societies in the distant past, especially when you can compare it to today. In fact, today, human beings today, we possess levels of human security that are utterly unprecedented in recorded history. Fueling all of this, fueling it all, is affluence. Rising material security has given rise to exploding literacy rates, as we see up on the screen, how literacy rates have emerged over the past few centuries all across the globe. And with them also have media technologies also proliferated. And here's, here's why it matters. When you read a book, when you watch a movie, and you are reading about or viewing the story of another human being who is different from you, what happens is your moral universes expand. And so the proliferation of media technologies and literacy rates has meant that our collective moral universes 
have grown, and thus the realm of who matters and who deserves human rights has also expanded. This is not to say that every human being matters equally to every other human being. That's not, what, that's not the argument. But it does mean that a rights revolution has emerged, wherein violence against women and ethnic and religious minorities, which used to be tacitly accepted and at times even valorized in the past, is now deemed wrong. Today, we criminalize and stigmatize that kind of viciousness. A hundred years ago, the Klan was a socially acceptable mass organization. In Europe, anti-Semitic pogroms were part of the moral landscape. As for sexism, violence against women was scarcely taken seriously. I mean, this is an advertisement from the not-so-distant past <laughs> where advertisers used domestic violence as a comedic way to sell coffee. Today, we all understand that there's something wrong with that. And in fact, that change in, in mindset means that today, police are so much more likely, though not always, but generally compared to the past, they are so much more likely to investigate crimes of violence against women. Not surprisingly, rates of sexual assault and homicide against women have fallen. So these American and Western phenomenon, these movements, these are global trends in which we see that emerging and rising moral universes combined with lower levels of violence have bequeathed a better world. And again, catalyzing all of this is affluence. In the last 250 years, we have seen the emergence of global prosperity unmatched in all of human history. In fact, until re relatively recently, most every human being lived in either absolute or extreme poverty. This map shows the year 1500. In the red, those are countries that do not yet have $1,000 of per capita income for their citizens. The places in the gray, that's where the economic activity is so low, you can't even measure it. So red is absolute poverty, gray is extreme poverty, and then there's one little orange spot. That's Italy. For the first time in all of human history, a country finally achieved a per capita income of $1,000. 320 years later, in 1820, this movement of global prosperity fueled by innovation, what we see is that Western Europe, Central Europe, and the United States had achieved Italy's one-time watershed. 140 years later, in 1960, most of the globe had caught up and then surpassed Italy's one-time record. In 2008, this is what's so exciting, is that China and India, which had been the most poverty-ridden and populous countries on the face of the earth, they are now wealthier than the wealthiest nations of, of, of the year 1820. Let's put it all another way. In 1820, 94% of the world lived in absolute poverty, 94%. 1975, it was down to 60%. 2015, that number is 9.6%. All right, so the world is less violent, it's more stable, and it's more affluent. Ah, the long run of history, things are getting better. But the problem is that we don't live in the long run, do we? We live in the short run, and the short run includes tragedy. This is Todd Hill. Todd's my first cousin. He is the youngest son of my dad's sister. Todd was polite, he was handsome, and he had this southern accent that was like, it was so thick. I mean, it was the kind of accent that you cut with a butter knife. As you can imagine, the girls always loved Todd, right? You can, you can imagine that. Unfortunately, along with all that charm came significant alcohol and drug addictions. A month ago, Todd went to the hospital where doctors diagnosed him with chronic pancreatitis, which is caused by decades of heavy drinking. And they told him, the doctor told him, don't leave, you need this emergency surgery now or you're gonna die. Todd refused. He got dressed, he left the hospital, he got on a bus, he went to a liquor store, 
and while he waited in line to buy his alcohol, he suffered a massive heart attack and died. He was 46 years old. If you listen to certain politicians and pundits, and you know who I'm talking about, you would think that we are living in the worst time in all of human history. That is absurd, because it is wholly ahistorical. <laughs> what we do know is that the world has become more stable, more secure, and affluent. At the same time, what we understand is that all crooked places are not straight. We might be the luckiest human beings to have ever inhabited this planet, but the killings in Darfur continue. Aleppo is an apocalyptic nightmare, and we Americans are the most ideologically divided since the Civil War. But cynicism and skepticism are easy. Tragic optimism, however, is not. If our forebears had the resolve to imagine a better future in the shadow of Auschwitz, surely we can match them by remaining optimistic in the face and in, of much more benign circumstances. Indeed, we are old enough to have endured tragedies that cannot be changed, but we must remain optimistic. We owe that much to Frankel, Niebuhr, Todd, and my dad. Thank you. Thank you.